War is a nasty business. You want to maximize your highest percentage chance of being able to make it home in one piece. That's acting. intense, what you just said right there. Who is the biggest threat we have today? Us. We will screw ourselves over far before anybody else does. So what's your concern? Trying to prove that women can do certain things or transgenders can fit into certain elements. Everybody's being affected by politically correctness. The only way that I really see that being lifted off of our society is a huge kick in the nuts. Wow like licking a Chinese doorknob in terms of safety right now. It's gas station sushi, right? It's not in your favor that it's going to pan out. I came here to get away from the craziness. And now you're right in the thick of it. On a deployment to Iraq, there was a group of Marines in the area that we were in, and they had an explosive detector dog. For me, that was where everything kind of clicked. Even dogs can sometimes experience PTSD? Absolutely. You really believe that? I, I know that. Your favorite one to train for war, for military? If you're looking to hire somebody, you're going to interview him, you're going to see what his skill set is. How do you interview a dog, though? My wife wants a chow chow dog. Yeah, yeah, Sorry yeah, to hear yeah. that. <laughs> I love chows, I love all dogs. You're not doing you or the dog any favors by adopting the wrong dog. But how big is the dog breeding business? This number should scare everybody. Does that mean that you kill them? No, not necessarily. So if there is such a thing as a heaven, you think it's filled with dogs? God, I hope so. Did you ever think you were made it? I feel I'm so close I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value taming, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate it. Now they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. My guest today is a three-time New York Times bestseller, and uh, he's a former Navy SEAL, and on top of that, he's a dog behaviorist. We've already been chatting it up on many different topics, so let's just turn on the camera and let's get right into it. Very, very interesting cat. Mike Ritland, thank you for coming out and being a guest on the Entertainment. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to have you, man. Thank you for your service. Oh, it's, a, it's an honor to be in a place to be able to serve, so I appreciate it. It's great. I feel the same way as well. But for you, you went to Navy SEALs. Like, I was just a soldier, a specialist in the Hunter First Airborne. You became a Navy SEAL. At what point did you know you wanted to be a Navy SEAL? Uh, I read a Popular Mechanics article in high school when I was, uh, I want to say, about a sophomore. Um, and I had grown up swimming. And for me, it, it was kind of the, the culmination of everything. It was uh, the ability to get in trouble uh, but, but get away with it and, and be paid to do it uh, in conjunction with kind of focusing on the maritime aspect, which is what I was the most comfortable with. So. Uh, for me, it, it just seemed, you know, reading it, I was like, well, that's it. This is what I need to be doing. And uh, so from that day forward, I spent the whole rest of high school uh, basically preparing myself as best I could to, uh, you know, to, to try to do that for a living. And so I, I graduated high school at 17, had to wait until I turned 18 to, uh, to actually go to boot camp and then showed up and uh, tried out and went straight to BUDS. So it was, oh, uh, straight to BUDS. Yeah. Well, I went to A school for four months, uh, Got intelligence it. specialist, which at that sure, time yeah. you had to, but, uh, or you had to go to some A school. But yeah, right after that, I went, went and uh, I, was, I was in BUDS at 18. So. How, how old were you when you knew you wanted to be an ABC, when you read that popular About 15. Mechanics? Oh, at 15. <clears throat> yeah. So pre-15, you're not, you're undecided. No, and, and I guess ironically enough, uh, I remember being in junior high during the, the first Gulf War um, and being just honestly scared, scared to death that our country was going to war uh, and, and being afraid that, you know, what if I get drafted? Like, what if this is still going on when I turn 18? Really? Like, I was, I was actually scared of it uh, at seventh grade. But uh, just a few years later, if that doesn't uh, speak to uh, maturity that, that testosterone brings as a, as a pubescent teenager, that, uh, you know, my, my role and, and uh, ideology towards that changed dramatically. So, uh, yeah, as soon as I hit about 15, I, w I wanted to do something. Both my grandparents were in World War II, and uh, I was just very inspired by that. So it was something for me uh, that I just I kind of grew up or grew into wanting to do as I became a, uh, a young man. W would they tell you stories? Would you sit down and want to hear stories? Like, would you gravitate towards it from a young age? I, I absolutely did. Uh, my mom's dad was in the Navy. Uh, he was on a minesweeper uh, in a fleet of 98 of them that were in the med. Uh, and only two of them returned. Uh, 96 of the 98 were either sunk or partially sunk or, you know, disabled enough to not make it back. Uh, and he had just, uh, he was a cook, you know, which was uh, kind of an interesting 
uh, change of pace, I guess, from what I wanted to do. But uh, but just to, yeah, his stories about pulling into port and and being at war in the Mediterranean in the world in World War II was uh, was really inspiring. My dad's dad was in the army. Uh, he was on the German front uh, and actually got um, got discharged from the army for getting in a bar fight and beating a. Uh, a fellow Allied soldier, an English soldier, actually beat him to death in a in a bar fight, and so uh, they sent him home. Which that doesn't tell you how how much time has changed or times have changed, and that uh, now you'd go to prison for the rest of he your life. He would go to prison like for the rest of his life today. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty interesting. What do you think about it? What t what makes more sense, though? To me, in in this grand scope of uh, of warfare, uh, which is ultimately what our military is is poised for, uh, I think it should go f far back to the old school. Oh, really? Uh, the days of hazing, and it, obviously there is a happy medium. I think hmm. you can for sure overdo it. Uh, back then, I think that's probably a little a little too far back. Uh, but you know, I, I know the difference between say when I was you know coming in in the early or the late '90s rather as an early frogman versus how it is now. It's vastly different in terms of uh, our ability to kind of police our own. Um, I think especially in the military that uh, that is a, a necessary, I wouldn't call it an evil, but just a, a necessary uh, augmentation to, to units being able to, to keep themselves sharp, honest, and, uh, you know, and, and have the right guys doing the, the right job for the right reasons. Now I think that uh, a lot of guys do it to, to check that box and wear the t-shirt and say that they did it. Uh, and when it comes time to do warrior shit, so to speak, uh, they don't want to have any part of it. You know, And I think that that's a huge problem. Interesting. And, and it reflects in, uh, in a lot of what's going on in the community nowadays, I think. In, in the community of SEAL, BUDS is what you're yes, talking I'd about. Yes, I'd say all yeah. of special operations. And okay. I, I would even say broad spectrum to the, to the entire US military. I, I think that there, uh, there is a problem with it being geared more towards a social experiment. Uh, I think the, the last uh, presidential administration had uh, had some negative impacts that way. I, I don't think what our society reflects in terms of you know how we, we view certain hotbed issues that are pretty polarizing, I, I don't believe that uh, it suits our, our military's best interest to meddle in those affairs whatsoever. Uh, you know, to me, I, I like to reduce it down and keep it really simple because it is simple is that the United States military has one job, and that's to go over overseas and, and break stuff and kill people in the event of them needing to do so. Uh, and every decision should be boiled down to, does it make us a more effective war fighting force, or does it not? If it does, then you should do it, irrespective of cost, irrespective of, of social heartburn that it might create, uh, and irrespective of really anything other than that singular goal of, is this what we're here to do or not? Uh, and, and it really needs to stay that simple. Is it, is it that black and white <clears throat> to you? It is, because it's, it's a, unlike really every other aspect of our life, or very few other ones, it's a, a mission or, or purpose built uh, you know, element where everything you do revolves around your ability to, to go places and, and be effective in terms of a war fighting force. You know, so uh, whether or not uh, women should be in certain roles or transgender should be allowed or, or any of those things, you know, to me the, I'm reminded of a, the Jeff Goldblum quote in uh, Jurassic Park, which is where he says, we, we've spent so much time thinking about whether or not we could or couldn't we never stop to think whether or not we should or shouldn't, uh, in, in, in relation to you know pulling the DNA out of a of a mosquito in, in amber or whatever. And, and to me, it's very much that way: is that trying to prove that women can do certain things or or that transgenders can fit into certain elements. To me, I think misses the boat. Is that it? it you know, to me, that that's not the place to do that. Uh, if if you want to have a an experiment that way, then do it in the Olympics. Do it in collegiate sports. Mm -hmm. First, you know, if, if you want to try something out, try it there where people's lives aren't on the line. Because uh, if you'll notice, you know, there's a pretty stark contrast between men and women in competition as it relates at a world class level. Well, in, in the military and especially in special operations, it's absolutely no different. There is a huge disparity uh, between sexes when it comes to uh, combative everything. Uh, take the UFC as an example. You know, there, there's a reason there's men's and men and women's competition classes. Uh, where, why is there not a push to make that co-ed? There's not. Why, why isn't there? Uh, why is there a push to, to have women Navy SEALs and women Rangers and Green Berets, but nobody gives a shit to have a 155-pound woman face Conor McGregor in the ring? Why, why not? Why, why is there not the, the same level of bordering on vitriol for, for that 
competitive equality that exists when uh, when the reality of it is is whether you take the Olympics or the UFC is that everybody knows what what the actual result would be and that would be an outclassing and uh, and I think very few if any women would win anything and, that, and that's why there are women's divisions in both the Olympics collegiate sports uh, as well as a uh, thirdly being the UFC to, to, to that, that led to two different parts what part of that do you think is the guy at the top who runs UFC because there's no way in the world he's going to tolerate that. You know what I'm saying? Where he's, Man, he's, he's not a personality that is like, well, I think it's fair. We have to be fair. And what about this and people's feelings? How much of it you think has to do with him? And how much of it has to do with media pressure and organizations to want to get to that point? UFC specific, unquestionably, that's a factor. Uh, however, there's no media pressure for that. Why isn't there? Why is there so much media pressure on female seals, green braids, rangers, etc.? absolutely zero when it comes to why aren't there just Olympic events? Why are there male, female? There, there's no heartburn with that. So UFC, yeah, you could say Dana White maybe has the personality that would make it bordering on impossible to do that anyway, but there, there's not even the effort to make that happen. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a number of other competitive uh, or combative sports leagues. There's Bellator, there's a, a bunch of smaller ones where there's absolutely no push for that either. Uh, and again, I would say collegiate sports, zero. There's crickets. Why is there an LPGA? Why is there a, a, a WNBA? Why, why is there not a push to have all of these women who play in those leagues play in the NBA and, and mandate that there's a 50-50 a percentage or a 60-40 or whatever the population is to reflect that? There's absolutely none. Why not? To me, the fact that there, there is such pushback and, and such... Uh, you know, a aggressiveness when it comes to proving that women can do certain things. I have no doubt that there are some women out there that can physically do certain things that, that any man can do. There's, there's, you can watch a CrossFit competition and see that for sure there are some that, that could probably make it through. My point is, is that from a, from a war fighting effectiveness standpoint, it, it doesn't matter. You know, and the reason it doesn't matter is because when you in interject different sexes into those types of roles, it causes problems. My idea or fix or whatever, not that, it, that I'm, I'm uh, individual in thinking this, there's a number of us that do, is I, I would say just have female special operations units that are all female the same way Israel has, has had actually enormous success with. Uh, you know, there doesn't need to be female SEALs, there could be female whatever you know, special operations detachment or unit that you want to stand up from scratch and have it be all women. I've got no problem with that. There, there are a number of applications where women, I think, are better suited than men in, in certain, especially covert operations, where women, especially in certain parts of the Middle East that, uh, that you can relate to, where women have far more access and far less microscope on them in terms of getting into certain areas versus not because they're women and they're going to be given a pass. I'm not saying that they shouldn't, uh, you know, have a role in combat. I think, I think, well, for for starters, they already do, uh, which I, I'm not going to get into any further than that. But there's there's no shortage of women that are already doing things that most people never hear about that, uh, you know, that are absolutely beneficial and worthwhile and should be uh, applauded. However, uh, in my opinion, and and I can say 98.9% .9 of all other special operators' opinions out there, former or active. Uh, mirrors that same thing. So, so, so let me ask you this. So you're not saying no to women getting into special operations. You're no. talking about separate the two and they're able to go in a different direction than maybe the men are going. So right now, when you went to BUDS, was it all men yes. when you went to BUDS? Because you went BUDS what year? It was... Uh, 97. 97. So you're, are you in high school class of 96 or 97? 96. 96. Yeah. So we're the same year. I'm also class of 96. Yeah. So graduate 96 and you go to BUDS in 97. There are no women in your class Correct. at all 97. Correct. How about today? To, to my knowledge, there still hasn't been any women that have actually classed up. Uh, there's been a couple that have tried uh, and have either failed or quit in the, in the pre-training phase, which is at Great Lakes, uh, which is you know, in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. J just after boot camp, there's a, like a couple month <coughs> pre-training period that uh, is supposed to get prospective students ready to, uh, to be a little, a little better prepared for BUDS, but none, none of them, to my knowledge, have made it past that. So what's your concern? What, what's, what's your concern since it's not, I guess, it hasn't happened yet? Uh, I mean, my concern is the principle of it, is, is the push to, to, uh, to make uh, that avenue available when, when that very simple question of, does this make us a more effective warfighting force? In my opinion, no, it doesn't.
in my opinion, it causes far more problems. And so I, I, I do think it is that black and white. When it comes to your mission is very black and white, uh, you, you can reduce those decisions in terms of whether or not it makes us uh, at a higher capacity or not very black and white. Uh, uh, interesting. When you, so you, you think G.I. Jane is more of a Hollywood story and not more of a real life story? It, it's 100% more of a Hollywood story, yeah. You know, again, I, I have seen some women in some capacities that I think physically could probably make it through training. Uh, not, not more than probably that I could count on one hand. Um, but my point is, is that even if, let's, let's say there was just being uh, liberal about it, let's say there was 20 women a year that, that had the, all of the, the different genetic traits and drive and, and physical attributes required to make it through training. Those, those 20 females in terms of their addition to the community, in my opinion, uh, are going to far uh, outweigh in a negative manner uh, the the war fighting efficacy of those units because there are women involved. I, I, wow, I, you really believe that? I, I know that. You know that. I know that. And how many of your peers would you say think the same way as you do? I, I don't know a single one that doesn't. Oh, I, I, okay. I, I threw the ninety eight point nine, making the assumption that there's probably a few people out there that, you know, have been out for you know long enough and and think you know yeah hey that that's great. But I can tell you overwhelmingly, every everybody that I know and have talked to has the exact same opinion about it. Uh, being overseas in a, in a forward operating base, it's, it's one thing to make it through training where there's a safety net and there, there's a mental safety net where everybody that goes through training, no matter how hard and, and how rough it gets, you have a, a primal understanding that at the end of the day, it's the end of the day, you know, and that your life isn't really on the line. Whereas when you are in a forward operating base and, and everything is, is on the, the or, or chaos is, is literally brimming day in, day out. That is a very, very different mindset. So let's just say you were, uh, 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 you went to what operations? You went on a few operations. Give me one of them. Just one. So one in particular was uh, the, the oil platforms that were about 25 miles off the coast in the, in the northern Arabian Gulf, but 25 miles south off the coast of, uh, of Basra in, our, in southern Iraq. Got it. There were uh, a number of... Um, oil platforms that my platoon from SEAL Team 3 as well as another platoon from a different team uh, took these oil rigs down uh, over the course of about six and a half hours. There was uh, about 30 of us and we captured uh, 23, I believe, uh, Iraqi prisoners of war, uh, secured the whole, the whole oil platform, took it down and, and uh, by sunset had it, had it secured and had them, uh, had them uh, bagged up. But Intense. Yeah. Here's a question. What if one of those 20 that you said per your King graduate buds mm -hmm. was assigned to be part of your unit? Would you feel comfortable taking that uh, uh, you know, assignment and going there with another woman part of your team? On the actions at the objective, yes. do, doing the actual yes. mission? Yeah, I would. Okay. If they, if they physically and mentally have, and, and this is assuming and taking for granted that no standards have been changed. And from my perspective, the no standards being changed are there aren't, there aren't female locker rooms. There aren't female birthing spaces. There aren't, oh, I'm sorry, you know, you, you have your period, so you're not going in the ocean this evening. There's none of that. You are treated absolutely no different. There's no accommodations made. What, what I think, though, is, is leading up into, until that point, if I, if I look back uh, and think of the amount of time that we spent getting ready to do that and the, and the close quarters living and the things that we went through as a platoon, uh, together to get ready for that, uh, I, I don't think a, a woman would have uh, been a, a value-added asset uh, in a platoon at that point. I, I think it would have caused more harm than good. For that assignment? For that specific For assignment. any of them. Oh, you know, for it, any of them? For any of them. Okay. Because the, the thing that's important to realize is that your time in a platoon is, you know, for those, I mean, you, you understand it more than most, I think, because of your time at the 101st, is that, you know, that, that ability to, um, to separate yourself from the entire planet, basically, from your family, from your friends, from everybody. And you're out in these super isolated areas doing really dangerous stuff day in, day out. Uh, it, it creates a, a specific bond uh, with each other that, uh, that exists differently, I, I think, than any other aspect of our society. And it's, it's hard to explain it. Um, but what I can say is that when we're in forward operating bases, and let's say, for example, there's a, an intelligence representative that happens to be a female, I can tell you from experience is that that causes problems, huge problems, is that when you have 16 or 30 or 50 or 100 ex triple, double or triple A personality alpha male men 
that are, are just exploding with ego and are ultra hyper competitive and now you have one or two females that are now all of a sudden in the mix, it causes huge problems. What way? Uh, I mean, I kind of have an idea. I'm just curious to know what you would say. In, in, the, in the way that you can imagine okay. is that you know the, the competition that exists on who can run the fastest, on who can pick up the heaviest stuff, on who's the best shot, uh, who can secure a target the fastest, Th that same uh, mentality and, and attitude exists towards women as well, uh, whether it's during the, the workup cycle or, or, or what have you, is that the, the biological differences between men and women are there. Uh, and when you take that, that uh, fraction of one percentage of the highest level in terms of, of professional soldiers who are at that level, who their, their job is to represent a nation and, and go to other nations and defeat them in, in their backyard, kick doors in, shoot people in the face, and, and, and be, be the best at it, is that uh, that, that causes problems. And even in just the competitive nature between who's the best shot and who's the best athlete and everything else, when you throw women in the mix, now you have a, a genetic component that in my opinion, again, I, I have no doubt there's a, a plenty of people that would argue, is that there, there is an element and, and I see this a lot in dogs too, this is one of the parallels between humans and dogs, is that men act towards women differently, especially in this country. Is that we, we are taught, most of us from day one, is that you treat them differently. Is that you don't put your hands on a woman, you, you do certain things for them, you protect them in, in the face of danger. And so if, if now I, I have 10 or 15 of my comrades, one or two or five or however many of which are, are a woman, your, your genetic hardwiring, in my opinion, is going to cause havoc in terms of now when, when bullets are flying and people are getting shot and blown up and are injured and some need to be saved, et cetera, is that now, now that throws, throws genetic hard wiring into the mix that is never gonna pan out in a positive manner. When I was in, the whole uh, don't ask, don't tell what's going on, right? And I remember um, uh, we'd go to clubs and you could always tell all of a sudden you go to all these clubs and suddenly you go into a gay club. Sometimes the gay clubs were the best ones to go to because you had uh, 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 no competition because you're going in the most beautiful woman who still love to go to gay clubs because they uh, uh, didn't uh, want to be bothered, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going all of a sudden the market's really smart and you're having fun. But then one of your guys, you notice, say, wait a minute, this guy's in the army, what are you doing? And he starts, like, that was kind of a, so I didn't know you were gay. Well, I, and, but it was don't ask, don't tell, mm -hmm. right? And this was 97. Mm -hmm. And when we got to the unit, I remember my sergeant would say, uh, don't ever be in a uh, room with a soldier, female soldier. Don't ever be in the barracks with one with doors closed. Just don't do it. Yeah. And I said, why not? He would sit aside and say, just don't do it. Why not? Then story came out. One of the guys was in, and he's saying, dude, I'm telling you, I didn't do nothing to her. But he went in and he told everybody that he uh, did take advantage of her. He raped her, and then boom, he went and he did some time, right? Mm -hmm. So, but no one knows the truth. No one was in there to know the truth. Where I'm going with this is the following. How much has it changed from don't ask, don't tell to today and now trans? Like, I remember you're in, you're sorry, hey, you piece of, you know, you think you're from L.A., you're, but you're a nobody, we're going to kick. And they talk to you, you know, they don't talk to you like a lightweight. Yeah. How, how, how careful do you have to be with your language today when you're talking to new recruits? From, I mean, I've been out for 10 years, so, uh, or actually over 10 years. I got out in November of 08, so uh, just from the people that I've kept in, in contact with that, uh, you know, that I value their opinion, uh, it's, it's changed pretty drastically, and that's, that's part of it. Uh, you know, again, hazing certain language, you know, that there are certain things that, again, this is, of course, always my opinion, but... Uh, you know, warfare, generally speaking, is, is a pretty brutal business. Uh, and it's one where you really can't have feelings that, that have the ability to be injured uh, or hurt. Uh, the, the way that, that we get offended uh, in our society today with the, the littlest thing. Um, you know, from, from an emotional standpoint, there's, there's a level of emotional uh, maturity and strength that, that has to be there for you to be an effective warfighter. And if it's not, uh, I think it causes problems, and I think uh, you know the Eddie Gallagher case as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I think is a good example of of where there's a newer generation of uh, soldiers that uh, that have grown up under the umbrella of political correctness, uh, and I, I see it causing problems with cases like that. You've got a guy who kind of grew up more in my generation uh, under a certain way, and and as it's as he's gotten older, uh, bordering on being a dinosaur in the community by by their standards, um, you know I, I see that that 
you know, that's where a lot of those problems come from is, is that you've got a, a newer crop of, of guys that, uh, that just view the world differently because they've, they've grown up in a different world. It's got, it's got to be very, uh, you know, uh, I remember there was a time where uh, uh, people, you, you kind of either wanted to be a ranger or you wanted to be a special forces. My buddy became a Delta who's got more of your personality. You know, we're going to the fifth group to be recruited to be 18 Deltas. And the last minute I come out, he gets my orders. He goes in Vicenza, the rest is history. He gets picked up by Delta, and that's the life he, live. he yeah. lives. And he did all this stuff, all the stories that he's got. Very good friend. We were at the same unit for two and a half years. He worked here uh, briefly for about six, seven, eight months. Um, you know, I, I don't know what it's like to want to be a drill instructor today. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. You know, like uh, the hat. You say, oh, my gosh, what would it be to be an instructor? Yeah. I bet it's so cool to be an instructor. I don't know if I would want to be an instructor today. I, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I was a SEAL instructor the last three and a half years I was in. Of course, that was, you know, 05 to the end of 08. Uh, and so even, you know, since then, times have changed drastically. Um, but again, I, I don't advocate brutality for the sake of being brutal. Uh, I, I don't advocate harsh standards just because you feel like being a dick. To me, it's it's 100% results driven, is that war is a nasty business. You want the best guys who, who are going to maximize your, your highest percentage chance of being A, successful, and B, able to make it home in one piece. Um, and, and to get yourself ready for things like that, uh, you, you have to run a tight ship, and you have to have high standards, and you have to be hard on one another. Um, you know, the, the, the pipeline, the process that exists, the, the selection, whether it's for Green Berets, whether it's Ranger School, whether it's BUDS, whether it's you know selection for Delta or, or Green Team for SEAL Team Six, all of those have one common denominator in, in that you know they, they are a result of this is what we need and this is the process that, that we have to use to get what we need, uh, and it's really that simple you know and so when you start to interject societal driven complaints or you know I would call it you know these politically correct norms that are becoming more and more normal that. That really, um, you know, offset or, uh, you know, really kind of fly in the face of, of those traditional standards that we have and maintain, and, and that have given all of these units the, the reputation and the success that they've had. You know, then that causes problems, and, and you're seeing it unfold as as we sit here. I don't think it's going to last a long time. Uh, I don't think it's going to last a long time. Here's why I don't think it's going to last a long time, because. Uh, um, you know, uh, when you think about the political correctness comes from a certain political party, right? You're not hearing it coming a lot from maybe the Republican side. You're hearing a lot coming from, uh, uh, you know, left or Democratic Party. Where you can't say this. You've got to be careful with this, right? And so then you have the independent that's kind of in the middle saying, just leave me alone. I'm a libertarian. I want to get to where I'll make money, but don't bother me. What is starting to happen right now is everybody's being affected by the, pol you know, politically correctness. The PC movement's affecting everybody. So... It's tough to be a comedian today. I mean, you got a Dave Chappelle that goes and does a stand-up, and, you know, oh, my gosh, that, you can't say something like that. What do you mean when he's given his, I don't know if you've seen it or not, the I Dave have. Chappelle. Yep. I've watched it twice. I couldn't believe how uh, amazing it was on how we explained everything. So I don't know how long this is going to last uh, on uh, the politically correct. Uh, I think eventually they're going to be like, look, we can't just do this. Somebody needs to go out there and say it. So... Uh, but we'll see what's going to happen. What do you think about that? How long do you think this could last? I think it depends on how, how long we are successful as a country. Um, I think that political correctness, uh, generally speaking, or as a whole, is a direct reflection of, of a country's successfulness. If you look at any other countries, we'll take your, your place of, uh, of birth as an example. Uh, political correctness really doesn't exist there, uh, at least not anywhere near in the same realm as it does here. Uh, why is that? Or if you take a look at the Philippines or Indonesia or any places where their GDP is, is a fraction of what ours is. And, and most of the day-to-day -day struggle is in survival. Why don't they have it there? Well, because they don't have the, the leverage, the flexibility, uh, or frankly, the luxury to be pissed or offended by certain words because it doesn't matter because they're too busy worried about just surviving. And so our country has been so successful for so long uh, no different than, say, uh, the Roman Empire uh, having having a similar fate, and that uh, you know, it's the, the the cycle of hard hard times create hard men, you know, and, and you know the rest. But you you get to a certain point where it's been so easy for us for so many generations to where now it's inevitable. So to me, it's it's 
a correction is coming of some sort, whether it's another country, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a coronavirus type of pandemic, who knows. But to me, the only, the only way that I really see that, that political correctness umbrella being lifted off of our society is, is a huge kick in the nuts frankly, is, is that that's what it's going to take for people to say, you know what, who, who cares about words? I got I to gotta feed my children. I think it's coming. I think there's going to be the huge kick in the nuts coming very soon. By the way, uh, coronavirus, how, how do you process that? To me, I think it's largely overblown. Okay. Uh, you know, to me, I, I think just like with most things in the media, you've got two, two major components that are contributing to how, how big of a headline it's, it's become and, and continues to be, which is it's an election year. Uh, overwhelmingly left-run media, um, and it's it's a way, it's one more way to further criticize the president. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a huge supporter or anti. I fall somewhere in the middle, um, but you know it, it's undeniable in my opinion that that the the media is doing whatever they can and using any excuse that they can to to try to attack him. That's part of it. The, I think the bigger factor is that uh, the media uses anything. Uh, whether it's Kobe Bryant or the coronavirus or transgender in the military or whatever it is, is that if they can fi if they can find certain stories and headlines that that separate people and piss people off uh, and polarize this country, is that what do people do? Will they watch? You know, and and nothing will make somebody pay attention closer than being scared. Uh, and if people are are fearing for their for their lives, of course they're going to watch the news 25 hours a day. Uh, and, and try to be spoon-fed so that they're the, the best prepared to deal with something that, in my opinion, you know, again, is, uh, is really not worth worrying about. No more than the flu, uh, the regular flu. I mean, I know the, the mortality rate is slightly higher, um, but if you look at, at least from, from what I've gathered, is that the people who are actually expiring from coronavirus are in the same health category as the people that, that die or have, have the mortality rate bands of uh, of the normal influenza, so I, I really don't think it's a big deal. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not worried about it, I can tell you that. What do you think needs to happen for uh, 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 President Trump to not get reelected? Not reelected, but not get reelected. At this point right now, even Business Insider said uh, investors from, uh, 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 from the left in New York, they said, if Bernie is the nominee, we're going to go for Trump. These are Democrats. Yeah. They're saying, if Bernie is the nominee, the, we're going for uh, Trump, but what do you think needs to happen? Like, could a coronavirus getting out of control hurt him getting reelected? For sure, it could. Okay. Uh, to the depths with which uh, is anybody's guess. Uh, I think for sure it's a factor. I think the biggest factor, frankly, is when you see the the level of support that's been garnered for a guy like Bernie Sanders, is that it's it's taken full advantage of what I just mentioned. Is is you know a politically correct, soft and weak society that doesn't really understand how the world works. Uh, you know, that, that there is no such thing as free college. Somebody's paying for it. Just because you're not paying for it doesn't make it, it free. Um, you know, and, and because social media is so manipulative, uh, and because our, our education system from K through 12, and especially in the universities, is so um, ignorant to the way this country was formed, and, and more importantly, why it was formed, uh, I think is is scary, and it speaks volumes in, in the fact that civics classes basically don't exist anymore. And if you ask anybody from the you know from the age of of even starting to be in the age of reason to say in their late twenties, almost all of them or almost none of them can accurately and and correctly answer basic tenets of our government, of how bills are passed, of basic American history, basic world history, and kind of why this country exists, how it got to where it is. Uh, capitalism is the reason uh, that a guy like Bernie even has the ability to get to where he is, which the irony is is ridiculous with that. Uh, and the fact that most people don't pick up on that, uh, to me, is, is frightening. Um, and there's enough people at this point, if you see how much success he had um, in, in 2016, uh, and how close he came, you know, and had the entire Clinton machine against him, had CNN was against him, I mean, the entire DNC was against him, uh, and he still almost beat her out. If he had had a fair shake, he, he very well may, may have beaten her out. F four years have gone by, and now he's that much stronger, uh, or I should say our society is that much weaker and, and that much more willing to hand over the keys to their everything to a guy who promise, promises them things that he absolutely, I mean, just mathematically cannot deliver. And the fact that people don't, don't understand that, that can listen to that guy talk and say, yeah, that sounds awesome, to me is, is frightening.
Why do you think he's getting so much momentum? It, it's for those, those exact reasons. It's a lack of civics classes. It's a political correct nature. It's, you think uh, that's it? You think I, that I, I absolutely do. I, th I think that, that our, our success has become our own worst enemy. How much, how much of that you put on the media? Uh, a lot of it, not all of it. I mean, it's, it's okay. a combination. It's, it's like with most things is that, you know, there's, there's a, a multitude of factors. The media plays a big role, but it's not the only role. You know, our success technology, as an example, has made our lives so easy to where we don't, as human beings, you know, for the first time in, in human history, in the last, we'll say, 30 to 50 years maybe, um, is the first time in, in thousands, tens of thousands of years where our main day-to-day -day isn't based around just surviving. You know, go, go camping in a national forest, not even at a campground in a national park or a state park. Go into just BLM land and, and, and live out of your vehicle or out of a tent for five days a week, self-contained, where you've got to purify your own water, gather your own food, gather your own wood, and basically just survive. And you'll find out in a matter of hours that none of the rest of it matters. And that's how we lived as a species for forever until just very recently. Uh, and so the, the, the technological advances that have made our, our, uh, our lives easy changes everything. It changes breeding partners, it changes how you raise your family, it changes what you give a shit about, it changes what your priorities are. When you completely alter all of those things that are vastly different from how they, they have been genetically ingrained in us for millennia, it's a flip of a coin as to what happens, and, and I think I think that's why you see the ridiculousness that you see at this point. Yeah, it's, it is ridiculous. That's the best way of putting it. It is craziness because I came here to get away from the craziness, and, uh, and now you're right in the thick of it. Yeah, and, and it's kind of like, well, you know, America's not a great country to be in. You don't understand what they do over here. There's a lot better places to go to in Europe, but everyone who's saying there's a lot of places to go to, they're not moving, they're staying here. Yeah, capitalism it, ultimately yeah. Reign, reigns king. But, I mean, uh, we, we lived in Iran and we said there are other places to go to, and people are like, well, then go. And we did. Yeah. A bunch of people left because there's many other places to go to that's better than uh, uh, when we were living there. Let me, let me ask you personality-wise. Do you, do, when you went to BUDS and you, know, you, you were out and you eventually became an instructor, and it, so you got two different point of views, right? You got the point of view of running with your guys, and you got the point of view of going and doing different missions and assignments, and then you have the point of view of being the instructor and kind of monitoring everybody and seeing that, that guy can make it. Like, you know, the game you play where before the instructor's like, oh, so who do you think's not gonna make it? Yeah, hundred bucks says that guy's not gonna make it, this guy's not gonna make it, you know, whatever, you're kind of watching everybody, right? right? Like when you go to a wedding with your friends and when we were in the army, we, you know, you're, you got drinking buddies and you go to the wedding, you would say, how long do you think? Nine months, yeah. 18 months, maybe. you know? <laughs> maybe, 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 right? Yeah. And you would, you if would, he's deployed half the time. If he's deployed half the time, she's at the club. Yeah. So yeah. you would sit there and you would talk about this stuff, but do you see a trend, do you see a trend with who makes a good seal and who doesn't like do you notice any commonality because personality wise you have a different personality than some of the other seals i've sat with but do you, what do you see as a commonality similarity between the guys that make it well so there's two two points i would bring up there's actually a third perspective that that i gained in being at a seal team for a number of years and and so i, I had the student experience i had the instructor experience but i had you know the the opportunity i would call it to also observe students after me that were coming to the team and how well they did you know and and, and during that period mm. you know was there a difference is there, are there trends even with the, mm -hmm, the new mm -hmm. guys and and i think it's it's human nature to always think it was harder back when i did it and you know the next generation is soft there's an element of that to everything that i'm saying however um i will say that you know the the commonality that exists to your your second question uh, just very plainly and simply is that the process is what that commonality is and, and that's the beauty of the process that is buds is that what what you don't realize as a student and maybe they do now because the gig is up I think much much more so than it was when I was a student in terms of prospective students being able to game the system a little bit and know you know what all the evolutions are and what the standards are and etc um, but but there's still enough of, of a cloaked element to that process that exists and just the fact that physically and mentally it is hard. I don't care who you are. You know, you, you can't show up in good enough shape to make it. There's going to come a point in every individual that shows up there that's going to have to re rely on his mind. Um, and so the, the commonality that exists between frogmen, even to this day, even, even though the process, in my opinion, has, has maybe wavered a little bit, 
um, is that you still have instructors that were put through by instructors that were put through by instructors, you know, going all the way back to the early 60s, you know, in the, in the Vietnam standards, that there's still an element of that that just gets passed down from, from instructor to student during that process. And so even now, I know some guys that I, that I worked with that are now still instructors there, that are still hard asses, that are still, you know, doing the over their shoulder and making sure that, that the students are, are earning it. You know, and, and uh, thank God for that, uh, and that the product I think is still adequate, um, but I, it's absolutely different. You know, and it's different because of all of the uh, the aforementioned PC crap. Sounds like you like the PC stuff a lot. You know, yeah, it's, I'm it's a like huge, you're a big I'm a fan, fan of it. I thought for sure you're going to wear like a pro PC shirt yeah. when you came in. This here. is actually <laughs> this yeah, is a yeah. pro PC it's blue, right? <laughs> blue is pro PC, isn't it? <laughs> So, so let's talk about dogs. So, yeah. what 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 happened with the transition of you know doing what you're doing to now becoming a dog behavior? How, how did that happen? Two things. One, I grew up uh, a dog guy in uh, northern Iowa. A lot of duck duck hunting dogs, labs, and uh, you know thing bird dogs generally speaking. So I was always a huge fan of dogs growing up. I was always a, a dog guy more so. I mean, everybody you know has it, or a lot of people have dogs growing up. I was really into it. Having said that, as I came into the Navy and and started to kind of you know, see in certain glimpses and, and different elements of the military and how they use dogs, that's when I really became enamored with that application of them. You know, I, I always marveled at, uh, you know, a dog or, or any canine's ability to use its nose and to, uh, you know, deal with environmental challenges that, that we would have a harder time with. Uh, but that was, you know, in, in enormously magnified when I uh, actually started to see them kind of work and, and what they were, were capable of. And so uh, on a deployment to Iraq, um, there was a, a group of Marines in the area that we were in and, uh, and they had an explosive detector dog that basically was responsible for saving the lives of a number of, of young Marines. And for me, that was where everything kind of clicked uh, and went from just being, you know, a, a casual, uh, you know, hobby or, or observation where I, I looked fondly on it to where we've been in a situation like these guys God knows how many times and, and we've never had a dog with us. Why not? And so from that point on, which is in, in early 03, until as I sit here, I, I just have, have not been able to satiate that desire to, to learn more and more about dogs, specifically to their use with apprehension and detection and, and military and police type of work. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a, you know, the majority of my adult life kind of dedicated to really honing and mastering and, and, and trying to um, be able to educate as best I can, whether it's police canine handlers, military handlers, trainers, civilians, et cetera, and, and kind of putting it all together and, and you know, the, the unique thing about dogs is that whether you're talking on, you know, a, a, a uh, high-speed explosive detection dog at a federal law enforcement or special operations unit or all the way down to, you know, the, uh, the neighbor's labradoodle that's knocking your kids off of his bike, um, the, the way that you train those dogs and, and a lot of the elements of just basic operant conditioning and basic canine psychology are the exact same. Uh, a and B may be very different, but the way that you get there is, is largely the same. When you were with the Marine guys, do you remember some of the guys' names? Like, were you close to some of them? I, I wasn't even there for the oh, actual okay. operation. It. It, they, they, they were operating in an area that we were in, uh, and it was basically hearsay is that, hey, they had this bomb dog that, uh, that found a, a grenade booby trap clump in the entrance of a, of not a cave, but kind of a hole in the, in the um, wall of a, of a berm, basically. Uh, and a dog found, sat on, and indicated on a couple of grenades that were booby-trapped right there, and that was it. And that, it, for me, again, it was just, we've been all over this country doing all sorts of different operations and raids, and we never had a dog with us. And, I, and, and for me, that was the slap in the face or the light switch of saying, you know, Christ, why are we not using these dogs in that same capacity? Had an old, old acquaintance who uh, was in a Marine, and he was all about the uh, training dogs. He eventually wrote a book about it. He's an actor right now. He does something in movies right now. The guy's name was Mike. But uh, I thought maybe there was some kind of, that would have been wild if there was some kind of a connection there. Yeah. So, so you're doing that now while you're a SEAL. Did you start training dogs then or not yet? That hasn't happened yet until you get out. Uh, on the civilian side, I did. Okay, um, got it. So at, at that time, uh, you know, in 03, 04, the, the start of the Iraq War, our, our meaning special operations use of canines was extremely limited. I mean, it was basically non-existent. And so as we grew as a community, just like any other uh, element that you're that you're adding to your war fighting force is that that takes you know years to really develop a, a level of competency where when employed overseas in actual combat 
it's it's a, an actual asset and not a liability. It. it takes a long time to get to that point. And so, uh, you know, I, I was training, you know, with Dutch Shepherds and Malinois and German Shepherds and, and different dogs in, in those same or similar capacities with either sport clubs or, you know, if I could get my hands on, on you know, training DVDs or uh, police canine training books, which, you know, there's, there's been quite a few of them out uh, over the years, or going to police canine seminars or anything I could get a hold of. Is, you know, I, I was buying dogs that were being imported from Germany and from Belgium and, and from Holland and, uh, and, and training with them and working them myself and, and doing a lot of things, kind of learning That's through cool. the school of hard knocks. And so uh, as I got, got closer to getting out, and in that same 2004 time frame, one of the biggest reasons I got into dogs was I, I got a fungal lung infection uh, where I lost uh, about 40% of my lung capacity. Uh, I was offered a, a medical retirement at the time, and, and at that time, I had my first uh, first child on the way. I had no college degree and no plan of getting out anytime soon. And so uh, with that wrench in the gears, um, that shifted of saying, okay, well, I, I need to figure something out. And so um, that coupled with uh, you know, the, the, the light switch moment of overseas of already having that. Uh, I was on convalescent leave for about nine months. And during that time, I, I was laid up most of that time and, and just was enamored by dogs and, and you know, breeding theory and, and uh, veterinary medicine and, and conditioning and, and you name it. Uh, and the more I learned, the more interested I was. As I got closer to being uh, a civilian is when I was offered a position uh, on the West Coast to be a, a canine handler and, and turned it down uh, to get out and start my own canine company. And, and you know, just like joining the Navy and, and wanting to be a SEAL, I've, I've really always taken the most bang for your buck approach in terms of my decision making process. And as much as I wanted to stay in and, and be a handler, uh, physically I wasn't 100% convinced that I would be able to do it and, and not be a, a liability to the team. Uh, as well as I, I felt like my impact would and could be greater felt by starting my own company and, and training lots of dogs, handlers, running courses, things of that nature. So. Which which dog do you find to be the your favorite one to train? Is there any specific one for war, for military, if there is one? Uh, for sure, the, the Malinois and the Dutch Shepherd, which in my opinion, there will be people that uh, you know will, will give me a hard time for saying this, but I, I view it like a chocolate lab and a yellow lab. In my opinion, it's basically the same dog. Uh, but the Malinois and the Dutch Shepherd, I, I think are, uh, if you're looking at just the basic breed standard, uh, I think percentage-wise, you find more dogs in those two breeds than any other breed that uh, successfully have what it takes to, to do that type of work. Interesting. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> when it comes down to uh, dogs, training dogs, so obviously for you, you do this professionally. Can anybody get good at training dogs as well? Anybody, anybody that's just, you know, an engineer at Raytheon says, you know what, I also want to know how to, I can train my dogs better. Can I get better at it or is it better off me sending my dogs to somebody who's an expert to train and then it comes <clears throat> back to me? Everybody can get better at it. Okay. To me, it's no different than really any other skill set. Uh, and you could take, uh, you know, carpentry or bricklaying or brain surgery or being a chef or what have you. Is that the people that have a, a natural innate ability or a knack for that type of work, whatever that type of work is, in this case, dog training, are the ones who are world class. Uh, coupled with the passion, desire, drive, commitment, and consistency, just like building a business or anything else is that you know if your goal is to be a good dog trainer your genetics are going to limit the the level at which you can you can attain in terms of being world class or just good or decent or great or whatever your drive and, and consistency and, and desire and, and will to succeed is what's going to at least allow you to, to cap or maximize that genetic potential just like in every other you know affirmation uh, yep. thing so you know, to me, unquestionably, I mean, the, the whole reason I started my online training program was to help people do it themselves. Um, yeah, there are some people that are, are probably just better suited to hand their dog off to somebody and have most of the training or even all of it done. Even in the dogs I deliver for, say, personal protection is that I spend a lot of time educating those new owners on how to handle the dog, how to think like the dog, how to view the world from the dog's perspective because dogs, you know, they, their their mind works more like a calculator than it does our mind. What do you mean by that? We think in a language. We're, we're, think about the, the, the amount of information that you and I have exchanged just in the half hour or so that we've been sitting mm -hmm. here. It's enormous. 
human beings overwhelmingly are verbal. We think in a language, you know, we conversate in a language, you dream in a language, you, you think about your goals in a language, daydream, etc. Dogs don't, right? Well, how, how do they view the world? Well, they view the world in simple association. So a dog's world is A plus B equals C with everything, you know, whereas ours is, is mostly verbal through either text or, or verbal communication. So uh, understanding that is, is really the, the, the backbone of being a successful dog trainer is that if, if you don't look at the world through the dog's eyes and, and think about uh, his interactions the way he views them, no different than you know a boss with their employees, a coach with his athletes, a, a teacher with their students, a, a parenting unit with their children, is that you've got to be able to relate to whoever it is that you're trying to teach, train, coach, educate, etc. If you don't, what happens? You, you know what you're talking about, they have no idea what you're talking about. And so most people's biggest problem is that they don't view the world through the dog's eyes, which is again a simple association. That's where basic psychology and very, very simple tenets of, uh, of operant conditioning come into, into play. So, so, so to move dogs and move people, uh, it, the, what are the similarities and what are the differences? So if I'm trying to move a dog versus moving a person, is there some similarities? In terms of moving them how? Not moving like m driving them, uh, motivating sure. them to take action. There's there's almost no difference. In, almost no difference. Almost no difference in that. Take any of your employees here, right? Is that what motivates them? Well, human beings have a, have a currency system that equates to everything else that they're driven for. Now, if you took away currency, right? Human Humans' ability to, to hold and, and possess and value currency yep go back to say bartering days, well that, that's exactly what that is. And so the key for the human being in terms of training the dog is actually very simple, is that you have to find out what motivates the dog. And then you use that to motivate the dog. Now, the, the problem is is that it's some dogs will bite through your hand to get to a tennis ball because they're that driven for it. Some dogs you could bounce it off of their forehead and they wouldn't even look at it. Some dogs love attention. Some dogs hate it to the point where actually going away from them is a reward. Some dogs' food drive is such. To, <laughs> some dogs' food drive is such. Similarly, is that some act like you know that they don't need to eat for the rest of their life. Some, even though they're overweight, act like they're starving to death. <laughs> uh, we've we've all seen the you know the fat lab not picking on anybody. Uh, but that you know that'll break through a, a cabinet to get to you know a box of milk bones that he can smell in, in a kitchen. So uh, it, it's really it's understanding you know a how that dog views the world and then b finding out what that dog is motivated for. And then the last component, equally simple, but uh, where people fail is that they're lazy. Is it setting up the environment for success? We do the same thing with our kids, right? You don't try to teach arithmetic at Disney World. Why not? Because they're distracted. Look at a classroom. Well, it's very focused. It's quiet. It's organized. There's rules. There's there's tenets of of principles that, that set those kids up for success. Same thing when you're training employees to do something. You're not going to do it at Starbucks, or at least I hope not. Why? Because they would be distracted. So with dogs, it's no different. I see people, you know, trying to train their dogs at dog parks or on walks or in their living room when there's nine kids running around and a cat and a squirrel and whatever else, uh, and the dog's not paying attention to them. So. It's, it's using the environment coupled with whatever they're motivated for in conjunction with understanding how they view the world, all, all joined together uh, for a very basic uh, principled system on, on how to reinforce the dog for doing what you want and how to, how to use consequence to extinguish what you don't want. And, and it's really that simple. All I'm thinking about is my dogs. That's where yeah. I'm going. Well, your you kids know? are the same way. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, it, they're all different. The way you're describing it is very interesting that some dogs just don't. I mean, these two are <clears throat> complete opposite personalities. Right. Just like with kids. You yeah. know? Uh, excuse me. Uh, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I can tell you I have three siblings. All four of us are polar opposites. None of us are alike. Even within the same litter, you know, just because they're your dogs at your house, you know, I'm assuming they're either different breeds or come from different litters at a minimum. Uh, all of those things, you know, the way they, they were raised, whatever their, their breed components are, their genetic traits that are passed down from their parents, uh, you know, what, what type of stressors or not uh, the female had while she was pregnant, you know, what was, it, what was the whelping environment like, what were the first six to eight weeks like in terms of human interaction versus not. You know, there's a multitude of factors, but the fact is, is that whether you're taking an eight-week-old puppy that had all of those things, you know, in its favor or to its advantage, or you're getting a, a four-year-old rescue shelter dog that's an absolute train wreck, the way that you're going to approach training that animal is exactly the same. Are you a cat guy or no? I like cheetahs. 
I like, I like big cats. I mean, to me, I like any animal that can provide something. So small domesticated cats. Uh, I like feral cats, Mausers that you know will keep uh, keep the riffraff out of a barn. Or like there's a there's a, a calico cat that kind of runs runs around my dog kennel that keeps keeps mice at bay. You know, there's a lot of dog food and and uh, other things that that entice rodents and vermin to uh, to come around. And and this uh, tomcat, he's pretty nasty. Uh, you know, he doesn't sweat the dogs, and uh, and he keeps the riffraff out. So, for me, animals, generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of just companionship. I love companionship of an animal that also provides something. I mean, that's why I like working dogs in in all different capacities. So, so, so you were never inspired to want to train cats. It depends. I, I, small I, I might, cats, small domestic cats. I mean, if, cats. if like if you were taking like, how would you train these cats? By the, cats the, the same way, I would use I would use markers and reinforcement. I'd use food with them. Um, I, I probably wouldn't mess with catnip or with uh, toys or things of that nature. I, I would feed them through training. Big misconception people have is that you're going to starve a dog. Uh, the way I like to couch it, and I go over it in my online training, but as I take. I uh, use crates and food uh, initially, just like we went through boot camp, right? Is that you're, you're conditioning a dog to behave how you want. However that is, however it is that you want the dog to behave, is that you're, you're setting yourself up for success by saying, okay, I'm going to remove the white noise by, by using a, a classroom-like environment to say, here are the things I want you to do. And you do that by waiting for them to happen, marking them and rewarding them. So I would do the same thing with a cat. I would use the cat's food if I wanted to and they did this, uh, you know, during the Cold War. Actually, they actually used cats to uh, to spy on on other nations' meetings and in uh, places of uh, of government uh, alignment and, and what have you. And that they would they would train cats to have listening devices or or small video recorders or uh, a host of other different things. But they would they would train them using using markers and reinforcement to uh, to go you know spy on on uh, Russian meetings basically. But uh, they did the same thing in World War II with pigeons. Uh, they would they would use pigeons to to peck at uh, navigation boards to steer bombs. I mean, it was the world's first smart bombs. Was pigeon driven munitions in World War II. Very interesting. Using the same mechanism. How, how have dogs been used? Obviously IEDs. I know some of them, but how I, what what are some of the ways dogs have been used? Well, to me, what what's interesting about dogs is that if you go back to say the first uh, recorded history of, of man combating one another, canines were used in a lot of the same capacities, whether it's carrying things, messaging, uh, or protecting, is that dogs were used very similarly to, to how they still are. And, and when you look at the scope of mankind and, and how it's, it's evolved from a combative sense uh, in terms of state to state, military, et cetera, is that you know now you've got smart bombs, you've got laser guided munitions, you've got FLIR video and infrared and thermal and, and all of these different platforms that uh, you know uh, twenty pound brains have have developed over the years. The, the one thing, okay, and this is the only thing other than the human being that we still use are canines. And to me, if if our our nation's tier one and, and tier three assets are our nation's most elite special operations forces have dogs actually out in front of them, protecting them. We don't use anything for, for anything other than that, that it works. You know, and, and the fact that our, our nation's best are deploying overseas, taking canines with them, ought, ought to tell you that they're still a very, very effective and relevant uh, war fighting That's tactic. intense, what you just said right there. Very intense. Uh, uh, some of the uh, famous uh, uh, dogs in wars was uh, Chips. Right, Chips is one with Patton. Mm -hmm. Apparently, this one got a purple heart and a silver star, but they took it away from him because yeah. they said dogs are equipment. Yeah. yeah. Right, and then you got Nemo, was a Vietnam War. This guy killed this dog killed two Viet Congs. Then Cario is obviously the famous one. I want to hear your thoughts on that. Lucas, one with Iraq, and he was the one that was uh, uh, off leash, just going around c collecting IEDs. So, Cairo, did you get a chance? Do you did you get a chance to work with them? Did you know the person that worked with them? You I, know, how did that story become as big as it is today? Sure, um, I, I have not uh, worked with the dog at all. Um, I have spoken with uh, his handler, Will, who actually has a book coming out uh, in a, in I don't know a month or two. That's nice of you. Put a plug in yeah, for him. Well, he's he's a brother. Will, he's this guy brother. likes you. Yeah. That's a good friend right there, it's, Will. Uh, Will Chesney. The, uh, <laughs> the, the the book we'll is actually called no, no Ordinary Dog, but it's it's basically the the chronological account of the bin Laden raid through the dog's eyes the way I understand it. I haven't read it yet but uh, so will give me a give me an advanced copy maybe but the uh, to me that that really highlights uh, and, and frankly that that raid in and of itself is really what catapulted me 
into the national spotlight. Uh, I was just at the right place at the right time. I had just left the West Coast Multipurpose Canine Program, uh, or was on the way out basically, uh, when that raid happened. Um, and when it did, uh, I think the vast majority of, of American citizens had just realized that special operations were using dogs. And not just dogs, but these laser-guided fur missiles, as a lot of people refer to them as. And, and the things that they were doing with them blew a lot of people away. And so uh, I was approached to, do, to actually do the book as opposed to me you know, approaching a, uh, a publisher. I, you know, they asked me to do it. Um, obviously, I ended up doing it, uh, and then a 60 Minutes piece uh, followed shortly after, and so all of that really just catapulted me into uh, a national spotlight, uh, undeserved, but uh, just, again, I, I was the guy at, at the right place at the right time for it, and so um, it, it was a neat experience and, and something where it was the, the national interest in, in that dog and that raid and knowing that, you know, using dogs to do explosive detection as well as apprehension and, and thwarting uh, ambushes and, and, you know, insurgents that are hidden in, in false floors or fake furniture or things of that nature that uh, a lot of people just didn't realize how valuable these dogs are for even our, our nation's finest. Yeah, that's wild. But by the way, how many dogs do you have yourself? Your dogs? Just mine personally, uh, I've got three. Uh, but it, it varies quite a bit. You know. what, kind, what kind of dogs? They're all Malinois. All, all of them? Yeah. So you're fully committed to them. You believe they're the best of the best. I, I honestly don't. Uh, it's not that I, that I think they are or I don't think they are. For me, I, I look at the dog completely irrespective of breed and sex. Interestingly, an interesting dichotomy with uh, from very the politically standpoint. correct. I, I can respect that. I mean, it's it's just the nature of it is that you know I, I've come across females that were that were absolutely good enough where you're not integrating them with other male dogs. I can tell you if 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 you had to operate in packs of sixteen dogs, I would not put females in for the exact same reason. When it's just one handler and one dog, there are females uh, occasionally that you come across that are every bit as good as as a male dog for that application, but it's it's just the handler and the dog, and that's the huge difference. But my point is, for me, it's the dog. If it's a German Shepherd, if it's a Pit Bull, if it's a Rottweiler or a Doberman, I don't care what it is. My test is what it is, irrespective of breed, sex, and, and whatever. And so the dogs that pass it are the dogs that I like. Are, are some easier to train than others? Absolutely, they are. Just like with people, some are, are more cognitive, some are more operant, some are, are quicker to learn, some of them uh, you know, have have their ability to, to offer behavior, uh, which translates to me being able to free shape a lot of the things that I want faster, is higher. Uh, there are a number of, of tests and batteries that you can do to kind of gauge, uh, you know, how, how cognitively driven a dog is or not, and that certainly plays a role. But for me, the number one trait that I look for in a good working dog for, for me to own myself is heart, just like I look for in, in people, is that I want a dog that when when I get in a bite suit and I pick a fight with this dog and I, I make that dog realize and understand that I'm, I'm there to take his soul, is that he, he pushes back even harder and says, you know, I'm going to take yours instead. And, and very few dogs actually possess that. Here's a question for my baby boomer community. Yeah. Do you believe you can teach old, old dogs new tricks? If, if they're genetically inclined to be taught, absolutely. There's, there's what, no, is, what does that mean? Well, so just like, uh, you know, we'll take MMA as an example, is that there is a, a physicality component that exists that once you get to a certain age, you're not going to be as fast, as strong, be able to recover as quick, et cetera. But, you know, you know the name Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson or Conor McGregor, mm -hmm. not just because of the training, right? Anybody can, can train hard, can, can work with the best people on the planet. Uh, you can put them with all the same coaches that Tyson, that Ali, that, that McGregor had. If they don't have the genetics to allow them to get to that level, you'll never know their name. And so with dogs, it's the exact same thing. And so when I test a dog, I'm looking at their genetics. I don't care if they have tons of training, no training, somewhere in the middle. Is that you know, It's their genetics that are going to dictate where I can go with that dog. Mike, I, you know, I, my wife wants a chow chow dog. Okay. Sorry I, to hear that. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I love chows. I love all dogs. I got to bust your chops a little bit. She, she's just, she just wants more dogs. And so I'm willing to, you know, kind of see what she says, uh, you know, what experts will say about this. And then we got three kids, an eight, yeah. a six, and a three-year-old, right? Yeah. And, and I hear stuff about dogs. You hear about uh, how pit bulls are with kids or this and that. Mm -hmm. What's your experience been with pit bulls or chow chows? Have you had any? 
I have. I mean, I've had experience with, at this point, uh, I can't think of a breed that I haven't had some some interaction with, uh, whether it's helping one of, you know, an, an owner of a certain breed work through some issues, et cetera. And my take, again, is that, you know, the, the breed is a very, very general and generic starting point. Uh, to me, breed is like race, you know, is, is that while while some in some instances there may be certain breed characteristics that are, are generally uh, consistent throughout the breed, I've seen enough individuals, both good and bad and, and high and low and everything in between of every single breed to say that, you know, good dogs are where you find them and, and it's the individual that's going to dictate, you know, where your right and left flank is in terms of what you can do or not do with them. What I would say is that irrespective of breed is that, you know, if, if you're going to a breeder or a shelter or whatever, uh, one of the lessons I actually teach uh, on my online training is how to evaluate a dog. To me, that's that's instrumental. It's no different than, you know, if you're looking to hire somebody, like you're not going to say, oh, it's a black male and he's this age, so yeah, you're you're the guy. No, you're going to interview him. You're going to see what his skill set is. And so to me... How do you interview a dog, though? Well, very similarly, is that just like I was talking about, you want to look at what they're motivated by. You got to right? find Doctor Doolittle. Like I got to go and no, no. figure out. We just to need to subscribe to my online training. <laughs> that's what it is. Okay. Uh, that's really all you have to do. Yeah. Now, the, uh, the, uh, I mean, the reality. By the way, a plug: teamdog.pet. Yeah. Teamdog.pet. Go ahead. You were saying. Well, I mean, it's, so it's it's a series of of similar tests, no different than an interview. Is that you have to look at, you know, what do I want out of a dog, right? And everybody's situation, scenario, family dynamic is going to be different. If you're a 96-year-old, slightly built female that, you know, needs a walker, a nine-month-old, 140-pound Great Dane's probably not your best bet. Yeah, it's it's uh, good assessment. You know, just, just as one staring you in the face, you know, uh, you know, thing. But But unfortunately, a lot of people, they walk through a shelter and I feel bad for that dog or that dog is cute. Let's pull that one out. To me, you're not, you're not doing you or the dog any favors by adopting the wrong dog. And, I, and this is something I, I catch hell for on a regular basis is that, you know, the, the adopt, don't shop mentality, uh, while sounds great, uh, and if you don't really think about it, makes a lot of sense. I would just ask anybody who, who revels in that mentality to, to stop and think for a second, is that ask yourself, are our shelters underfunded? No. Uh, they're, they're the best funded and most well equipped of, of any time in our society. Are they really? Because most people don't. I didn't know that. Well, they are really. They're, I fun. mean, they're everywhere and, and they're full. Well, why are they full? Most people think it's because not enough people are spaying and neutering their dogs. Again, my, my perspective, having spent a couple of decades now seeing dogs in shelters, pulling some of them out and actually training them and, and, and them ultimately winding up in, in uh, our airports for TSA sniffing bombs, dogs that I've pulled out of shelters that were of that caliber. Can't take any dog that does that, but my point is, is that for all of the people that say, be a responsible dog owner and, and spay or neuter your pet, my, my twist on that is that if you as a prospective dog owner have that little ability to control your animal from breeding, you should not have an animal. You shouldn't have a dog, period. I, I would go with maybe a goldfish or something that's way easier to, to contain than a dog because if you can't keep them from having puppies, you've got no business teaching them how to heal, teaching them how to not knock kids over, steal food out of the trash, etc. Like that, that's one of the most basic tenets of, of dog ownership is don't let them breed, right? And so the the, the reality of, of the overpopulation or the filling of shelters that exists is primarily in, in the people that are breeding dogs at that lower end of the spectrum, right? That are the couple hundred dollar Craigslist or whatever, uh, you know, type of, uh, type of environment where people are buying them whether it's out of a shelter or out of the paper, is that if everybody was educated enough to be able to evaluate dogs and say, no, you know, yeah, it's a cute puppy, it's got shitty nerves, it's scared of its own shadow, it won't eat, right, and, and it's shivering in the corner, I'm not buying it. Well, guess what, now your demand doesn't exist, right? Because everybody, and I, and I get that, you know, the, the road to hell is paved in good intentions, everybody's heart is in the right place, they see, you know, the, the shivering, pit bull in the corner and they want to save that dog, I'm not saying necessarily do or don't do that. What I am saying is that if we raise our standards as a society, then then when as soon as people stop spending two, three, five hundred dollars on newspaper classified Craigslist ad pets, the demand for them goes away. People will stop breeding them. The only reason people are breeding them is because people are buying them. It's that way with drugs, with guns, with anything. Uh, and so to me, it, it's a paradigm shift. The other thing to keep in mind is that shelters, God bless them, 
do you really think it's in their best interest to be empty? No. Think about that for a minute. If you run a shelter and you've got five staff and you have no dogs in your shelter, what are you out of? A job. What are you also out of? Funding. Um, it's also, I think it, it seems to be lost on most people that when you go to a shelter, how many of those dogs are free? Almost none of them. You know, it's usually a few hundred dollars between a spay and neuter fee and an adoption fee and a processing fee and a blah, blah, blah fee. Is that, you know, ultimately what are you doing? Well, you're, you're still spending money on subpar dogs that are now being fueled by these, these backyard poor standard breeders that are filling shelters, that are filling mm. backyards, not adhering to basic tenets of, of breeding practice and theory and, and, and genetic selectivity. That if, if more people did that and more of the consumer was better educated to be able to identify, no, that, I, I want nothing to do with that dog. Then, then that problem, it, it would suck for you know, a few years, but those tides would turn if people would be, would be much more staunch advocates for good genetic breeding practices, vice tugging on the heartstrings and just grabbing whatever dog needs to be saved. Define suck for a few years. What does that mean? Because to do that, some of these dogs, if they don't have a home, you, you home, you got to do something to them. Right, and so you, you would have a, an, a, a bubble burst, just like, say, the housing market in, in the late 2000s. Is that you know there would there would be an excess of dogs that nobody knows what to do with, um, you know. But but again, let's say you know the happy medium is you have no kill shelters that, you know, you, you just house them. But if if you have educated people that say this dog has no business being adopted out, does that mean that you kill them? No, not necessarily. But what it means is that they don't get adopted out because if they don't get adopted out, now there's not room for something to take their place and just continue that shitty, vicious cycle that exists and, and continues. I mean, this number should scare everybody. 3.3 million dogs are surrendered to shelters every single year. Why is that? All of the things I just talked about. About 3.3 million? 3.3 million, and that's every year. And that's 800 and some odd thousand on average are euthanized every year, which breaks down to over 2,000 dogs every day. All right, 2,000 dogs every day are euthanized in, in just in this country alone. Well, if the, if the Bob Barker don't forget to spay and neuter your pets at the end of, of Price is Right and, and the Adopt Don't Shop campaigns that flood Facebook on National Pet Day, et cetera, and, and the breeders who get chastised for having you know, selectivity in, in, their, in their breeding uh, practices, if all of those things didn't happen, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have these problems again, in my opinion, is that you, you've got to raise the standard. How, how big is a dog? I have friends that are breeding dogs and they make decent money out, but how big is the dog breeding business? Well, it, it depends on, on what you're breeding for. I mean, I do very little breeding because it, it's a terrible business to get into if you're doing it right. Uh, which well, it's a terrible business to get into if you're doing it right. Right, because when, like, let's say I, I find you know male A and, and female B that are both consummate, textbook examples of what I'm trying to reproduce. Yes. And, uh, and I will say this, is that from my perspective, if you are breeding, for do breeding dogs for anything other than those two things, is that this is a consummate, perfect example of what the breed standard is and should be, you should not be breeding those dogs. That's, that's my, my philosophy on it. Even when I do that, let's say there's a litter of eight dogs, is that there's gonna be a few of them that are really nice, there's gonna be a few of them that are average, and there's gonna be a few of them that are a little below average. Not always, sometimes maybe most of them are great, sometimes most of them are less than great. My point is is that to, to be able to breed those dogs and spend the time that you have to spend with them to make them uh, maximize their genetic potential, which is in, in, separating them, right? As an example, a lot of people leave puppies with their mom and together until they're eight weeks old. Why? Because it's easy. A lot of people justify it by saying, well, it's what nature intended, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it is if they were left in that environment. Well, here's the, the kicker is that they're not, right? Is that though every one of those dogs' ultimate goal is going to be to either be with a family or with an individual human being, right? And so my philosophy, which, which has uh, helped me out tremendously in terms of producing nice dogs, is taking that, that each of those individual puppies and separating them from their mom and from their litter mates 
far sooner than eight weeks. I want to get them paired up with a human being or several human beings as fast as possible so they fall into that routine. The longer you leave them with their litter mates and their mom, the harder it is to pull them when they're older uh, and, and the more trouble you're going to have in terms of exposing them to environmental factors that may sketch a dog mm. out a little bit, yeah. loud noises, Home Depot, et cetera. How, how big is the business, though? Is there, is, are people making money? Is there people making real money? Not, or real, not? not In my opinion, not real money. No. Like a million dollar year income, no, no one's making no. that kind of money. No, absolutely. Six figures, yes. Mm. There's probably a few... Uh, there's probably a few breeders that have the ability to make six-figure businesses, but it's, I, I would say it's very, very few. What's the be- what, 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 do peop- what does the market pay the most for? Uh, from, I mean, I'm not really in that market, but from what I gather just based off of clients that have problems, it's a lot of the designer breeds. It's certain colors of, say, French Bulldogs. Golden Doodles, all of the mix, you know, the the cockapoos, the you know, whatever. It's the it's the mixing of, of breeds and creating these fad designer breeds. I think uh, is a big problem. Uh, but then you take any of the more popular breeds, whether it's Labs, Rottweilers, Pit Bulls, whatever. Each of them kind of have their their niche in society that exists that uh, that fuels that demand for for backyard breeders and, and sub sub breeding practices. Got it. Uh, on a side note, you know, these dogs when they come back. Uh, you know, I've, I've read multiple articles that even dogs can sometimes experience PTSD. Absolutely. What does that look like when dogs are experiencing it? Uh, again, it's very similar to the, the manifestation that exists in human beings. Um, the, the key component, uh, just like I was talking about earlier, it's a simple association, right? So with human beings, we have the ability to, to use logic and reason to, to try to understand or be bothered by what, what happened to us in combat or in a traumatic environment. With dogs, they're making that simple association, right? So, let's say a dog is is averse to gunfire because it's been, you know, it's making that A plus B equals C association with gunfire. You know, uh, being in, a, in an armored personnel carrier, A plus, you know, gunfire, B equals C, chaotic, stressful environment for an extended period of time where my my nerves are shot and I shut down, right? And then the next night you go out, you're in an armored personnel, you know, A. Gunfire B, I shut down C, night after night after night. And so now the presence of A, it may be an armored personnel carrier just rolling up and the dog starts mm. shivering and blows its anal wow. lines and shuts down. It's, you know, when A plus B equals C enough, the, the mere um, presence of A equals the anticipation of C. And so the good news with that is that you can use that same logic of now replacing those with something positive. So let's say it's gunfire, which is very common, or helicopter noises. So now I'm going to pair playing tug or ball or feeding or uh, playing fetch or something like that with gunfire, but it'll be like a 22 caliber from uh, you know, 600 yards away where you barely hear it. And that, that is just occasionally present while we're playing tug or playing ball or, or experiencing positive things. And then you just slowly stair step it. Think of it like a, like a piggy bank. You got positive and negative coins. And, and if you've got 400 negative coins as it relates to gunfire, you want to put five or 600 as it relates to, to something else. It makes sense. And now uh, I'm starting to realize why uh, one of my Shih Tzus has PTSD due to my oldest son. It's very yeah. obvious. You know, yeah. he's, uh, he, my oldest son is nonstop with them, you know, yeah. and I see his, his reaction to it. Are you a religious man, by the way? I am not. You're not a religious I'm man. No. Nope. Do you think all dogs go to heaven? Uh, I, I think that uh, I believe in the Rainbow Bridge. I'll call it that. Uh, I, I do believe that, uh, or I guess I would, I'd say I'm cautiously optimistic that dogs go wherever uh, any of us go, if if there is such a thing. So, if there is such a thing as a heaven, you think it's filled with dogs? God, I hope so. I don't know if cats are going to make it, though. I think the cool ones will. The, the cool yeah, cats are going cool to make it. Yeah. <laughs> to, to finish up with a couple uh, serious topics here is, <clears throat> I'm from Iran. Obviously, you had some experience being over there as well. Uh, wh- what are your thoughts? You know, what are your thoughts about what's going on there? How bad could it be? And what needs to happen? I guess this would be my last question on that topic is, how bad is it really? And what needs to happen for the Middle East to kind of calm down yeah. and uh, for there to be less friction? I think, uh, I think similarly with corona or any other headline, I don't think it's as bad as it's made out to be. Uh, I don't, that's not to paint a picture of it being a picnic. Uh, but I, I think uh, in some ways it gets overhyped, especially when you have a, a far left media and a right wing president. Anything he does or doesn't do uh, gets ostracized and, and I think further inflames in or fans the flames of, uh, of that conflict. 
Uh, having said that, I, you know, it's hard for me as a, as a former military member, and this may surprise a lot of people, but um, it's hard for me not to put myself, you know, I, I do so much projecting with dogs is that I, I find myself doing the same thing with, with other nations, other militaries. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to be naive or deny the fact that if Iran decided to build a, an Air Force base in Mexico that we wouldn't have some heartburn about that. Uh, or if China had a, um, you know, a, uh, an aircraft carrier group 40, 45 miles off the coast of San Francisco hanging out that we wouldn't, uh, you know, get our panties in a lot over it. Um, you know, to me, there, there's obviously an element of, you know, trying to, to strike a balance of having a presence in a region where uh, it, it seems like there's a, a necessary level of involvement. On the same token, um, you know, to me, warfare, again, when I reduce it down to the most simple uh, equation, which uh, I, I am a, a firm believer that some of our world's most complex problems actually require the, the simplest of solutions. And I look at foreign policy no different than a bar fight, right? Is that you walk into a, a Chili's and, and the shit has, has hit the fan in there and you've got Iran and, and every country in the Middle East and, and America, everybody's fighting. Well, when you walk in there, I don't care what you do, right? I don't care if you get involved, you're going to piss somebody off. If you don't get involved, you're going to piss somebody off. If you take this person's side, you're going to piss the opponent off. Uh, you know, so th there's there's no way to get involved in foreign policy militarily without having that ripple effect that we that we learned uh, a painful lesson, as did Russia uh, in Afghanistan in the 80s, 70s, and 80s, is that uh, you, you cannot have a presence somewhere without it pissing somebody off. Uh, that's the reason Al Qaeda exists. Um, you know, because of, of Kuwait. That's a and, very good point. You know, so to me, it, I, I look at it very simply, is that if, if we're going to decide to, to step into that bar, and I'm not saying don't step into it, I'm just going to say if, if we decide to step into it, is that it, it better be all in, it better be absolutely necessary to, to maintain our way of life and our standard of, of American security, and when you go in there, there are no rules. A lot of people don't like hearing that. Uh, I f fully subscribe to the Civil War Tecumseh Sherman mentality of you make it so god awful that the other side wants to stop fighting because you've made it, it it's so miserable on them that you You subscribe to that mindset. I absolutely do, but there's a caveat. And it's what I just mentioned is that you don't step into that unless it's absolutely Makes necessary. Sense. If it's absolutely necessary yeah. and we as a country are all behind it and say, yes, we have to get involved here, then you go there hmm. and, you, and you leave it to your military, which that's what their job is, is to go over there and absolutely wreck shop and, and you know, whatever it is, you know, whether it's destroying an enemy, wiping a, a certain population, uh, you know, off the planet. Really? What, what, wipe, wipe, like that, that, that far if necessary? I mean, to me, if, if, if we're going to involve our troops... You know, otherwise, you're going to see exactly what you've seen, right? As you, as you see, I mean, let's let's take Afghanistan as an example. What what have we really gained? Twenty years later, you know, now we're we're trying to meddle in a in a peace deal with the Taliban, which is, you know, like licking a Chinese doorknob in terms of safety right now. Like it, it's it's fragile at best. Uh, it's it's dicey. It's uh, it's gas food or it's gas station sushi, right? You're not you're not uh, it's it's not in your favor that it's going to pan out, right? So. We're, we're still messing with it. And if you look at, you know, hills that were taken and fobs that were secured and, and this region that we overrun and then gave it back, and same thing in Iraq, you know, and, and I don't look at any of my friends. I've got a lot of them that have lost their lives. I don't look at, at their, their lives in vain. I view it very simply as that we all volunteered to, uh, you know, write a blank check up to and including our life payable to the United States government for them to use us in the way that they see best fit, and that's honorable. You know, and, and it doesn't matter how they use you. You do the best of your ability, and, and how they use you is, is their business. It's the country's business. You know, we all, we all served our purpose, and, and we did what we did because we wanted to. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's honorable, and, and I, don't, I don't view any of, of the deaths in vain. But I would also say is that to prevent, uh, you know, further people from dying for reasons that are hard to really explain as to, as to why it was necessary and, and how it's validated is that, you know, you've got to look at things of saying, okay, if, if we really need to go there, then you do whatever you have to, to to keep the other side from fighting. I mean, we did it in World War II. Uh, was that the right call? I don't know. You know, I wasn't alive then. It's been long enough to where I'm not privy to, to the information that, that uh, you know, gave, gave our, our government the, uh, the decision-making process to say, yes, we're going to drop 
you know, these, these types of munitions on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But what did it do? Well, it, it stopped the war that fast. You know, uh, right decision? Did we make the right I, decision with that? Like I said, I, I don't know. You know, not not having been alive then, and not, and not being privy to to what it was like then, and and you know, sitting in on intelligence briefings where where I'm being told, here are all the fronts, and and here's the supply routes, and here's our casualties, and here's where our finances are, and here's where our country. I mean, I, I don't know all of those things. You know? Let me ask you, do, what for the way you process issues? When do you think would make sense for America to use it? To, uh, again, because that, that's not been done for a while. Yeah, what, I, what, what does another nation go to push the buttons or cross the line for us yeah. to say that acceptable, based on your opinion? Yeah, I mean, so in, based on my opinion, I would say a, a level of threat with which you can undeniably uh, prove that there is a level of existential threat to the safety and security of, of our, our homeland. You know, if, if you can say yes, absolutely, if, if we don't do this, our nation will fall, to me that justifies it. That's, that's really the only circumstance that, okay. I, that I can come up Got with. Got it. Yeah. I, I think most people would agree with that yeah. if you're saying to get to that point. Well, and, and so, the, you know, to bring it back to my, you only get involved if necessary, there's a lot of things the that we... The Sherman, Sherman principle you're talking right, about. Right, is, is that that's, in our, that's yeah. in our country, is that if, if we don't defeat these guys, our way of life disappears. And so he did what he had to Our do. Our way of life disappears if we don't defeat these guys. Right. God. Who is the biggest threat we have today, based on your, your opinion? What do you think it is? Us. 100% us. I, I think we, we will we'll screw ourselves over far before anybody else does. Wow. In which way? Uh, in, in the way that I've been uh, harping on in terms Aside of... Aside from that, anything outside of that or no? No, I, I, you know, I mean, you, you divided, you stand, united, or, uh, yeah. you know, united, you stand, divided, you fall, is that that, that mentality is, is far more toxic, poisonous, and dangerous than, than any outside threat. Look at 9-11. You know, 9-12, we were, we were undefeatable. You know, that's wisped away over time. But that level of attack on us does what? Well, it unites everybody where there was no Democrat, no, no Republican. Yeah. Every, everybody was 100% ready to go just rip the heads off. You think of, we need another crisis like that? I, I mean, you need, think You think man needs it to come? You know, you know how sometimes, like if, <clears throat> I know you're not a religious man, but you think God created the system in a way where you lose a father, then a mother, for you to realize the value of life. Like, do you think we almost need a crisis to realize how lucky we are to live in a nation like this? For sure. I, I think there's an element of suffering, required suffering, that is built into the human condition. That, you know, when I look at some of the most successful people in the world are also some of the most miserable people in the world because they, they lack challenge. I think just like uber successful people, just like our country is, is that if you're successful and comfortable enough long enough, you get complacent to where, you know, you, you fail to find purpose. And I think, you know, that's one of the most dangerous mindsets that a human being can possess is, is when they lack purpose and they're comfortable. For full disclosure, you're not talking about the most successful people or the most miserable. It's people that are no longer driving for a purpose bigger than them. That's kind of what you're trying to say. Yeah. but You're, I, not, you're not just saying somebody that's a no, million or a billionaire. Not necessarily. Yeah. But, you know, <clears throat> I mean, to me, when you see a guy like, say, Chris Cornell, you know, the, the lead singer of, of Soundgarden hanging himself, you know, or Robin Williams or, you know, Obviously, there there's some troubles there, but I think if you if you open it up to a more thirty thousand foot view on just this country, our country is is the most successful, wealthy, technologically advanced, and comfortable it's ever been in the history of of ourselves. What are we also the most depressed, the most ADHD ridden, the most uh, pain and pain narcotic and um, and anxiety medication addicted that, that we've ever been and, and arguably the most div, uh, divided and miserable we've ever been as a country. I, I don't think that's an accident. I think it's a direct correlation of, of again, the technological advances and that how that translates to dogs is that, you know, we've got access to the most information as it relates to dog training that we ever have via the internet, right? Even with that, you know, there, there are more people struggling with their dogs now than, than ever before because there, there is a disconnect from nature. And, and training a dog is, is a borderline primal experience. And so it, it, uh, I think it all kind of just fits together. I got to tell you, man, I really enjoyed this. I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't know what to expect when you, you were coming You thought it was going to suck. No, because the way you speak, man, when you're speaking your tone, I'm like, this, this could be, but I tell you, you're a ridiculous storyteller. 
Oh, and, and you're the kind of guy that if I was, I'd, if I would have loved to have served with you because you Likewise. have a side of your humor is ridiculous. <laughs> your sense of, well, what's the, is it the Yogi Berra sense of humor where you like, yeah, almost have to be smart to understand it because yeah. there's like a three second delay. You have a little bit of that. I, I mean, I pride myself on, on more on the highbrow side than the low, but. Uh, I, but I appreciate yeah. that. It's very obvious you're very sensitive. Are you an April baby or when's your birthday? July. July what? Uh, towards the end, Leo. I'm a Leo. You're a Leo. Huh. Interesting, man. Yeah. Interesting, uh, 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 your wiring. Very, are you a big reader or no? I am. Very interesting. Uh, okay, uh, again, I really enjoyed it. Going back to teamdog.pet, yeah. any information on, the, on what you do with dog behavior, they can find it on there. Can you tell us a little bit about that website, what I'm going to find when I go sure. on? Sure, it's, so it's, it's as simple as I can make it in terms of uh, you know, expounding on the, the tenets and principles that I've spoken uh, about as it relates to dog training and just giving you video representations of all of the things that I'm talking about. I have a, a book called Team Dog as well that, you know, I, I had enough people read it and, and actually ask if I would make videos and start a YouTube channel, whatever. So I started a, an online training. It's $99 for unlimited access for a year. And that's I, it. And that's it. And I, and I get in there every Monday morning and I answer questions in, in forums. I, I interact with people uh, every week. Very cool. Uh, so it's, it's, I wanted to make it very affordable for your average everyday dog owner so that we could at least try to get rid of that 3.3 million uh, number. And, and, you know, between my philosophy on, on breeding uh, and raising that criteria in conjunction with trying to educate dog owners how to, how to evaluate, how to train their existing dog and, and live a little more cohesively. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't looking to retire on it. I just I wanted uh, it to be worth it for people to do. Much, much, much respect to you, man. You, uh, I, like I say, I know when I meet somebody that's sincere. You are so sincere. You're you're a man on a mission with what you believe in with your dogs. The man is a three-time New York Times bestseller for a reason. We're gonna put the links to all your books. He didn't ask me to do it because he said let's just talk about what he's doing with the courses. But we'll put the links at the top. Will be the link to the website that he has. We'll put the links below as well for his books and how to get a hold of them. With that being said, Mike, thank you so much for coming out and being a guest. I really enjoyed it, brother. This was great. Thank you for having me. So we covered so many different topics in this one. Woman in the Navy SEAL, politically correctness, dogs, Trump, coronavirus, so many different topics. If you enjoyed this interview, I got two other videos I want you to watch. One of them is with General Spaulding when he broke down the effects and consequences of 5G. If you've never watched this, you got to watch this. And if you haven't watched Jordan Peterson's interview I did, I want to say a year and a half ago when we talked about political correctness, click on this one here uh, as well. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.